and welcome to Kourou for Ariane's Plus Flight 118 with Telecom One. Commentary in English for this launch is by Monsieur Chitika. And Simon Hayes. Et puis en français par Guy Dubois. Thank you, Simon. Bienvenue à Kourou pour tous ceux qui nous regardent à l'occasion de ce lancement Ariane 4 vol 118 avec Telecom 1. Nous saluons tous ceux qui en Guyane vont assister à ce lancement ainsi qu'en Europe. And in Washington, Tokyo and Jakarta. We are approaching the end of the 14 and a half hour countdown for flight 118. All systems are go, all launch authorization parameters on the status panel are green. Uh, let's keep it that way. Uh, we have a window of nearly two hours for this launch and it's looking good for liftoff, not much more than 27 minutes from now. Our first piece of film was shot five hours ago when the gantry was rolled back off the launcher. In real time, it takes not the few seconds you'll observe in this clip, but a full hour to shift this huge structure, 98 meters high and weighing 3,800 metric tons, a distance scarcely more than its height. With the gantry withdrawn, third stage fueling with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen can commence. The very low temperature of these propellants, minus 250 degrees Celsius, requires preliminary chilling of the fueling circuits. The complete operation takes over three hours tailing off just five minutes before liftoff. In this state, Ariane is secured and stabilized only by the launch table clamps and the cryogenic arms. But now, a step back in time with a film resume of the launcher preparation campaign. The launcher campaign, lasting 25 working days for the Ariane 42P, was conducted in two phases. The first two week phase was spent in the preparation zone assembly dock. This involved first erection of the first stage with it four uh, engine on the mobile launch table, then mating of the second stage with its uh, single engine with the first stage, then assembly of the cryogenic third stage which burns uh, liquid oxygen and hydrogen with the two lower stages. And finally, integration of the vehicle equipment bay, which incorporates the onboard computer and auto launch command and control electronics with the third stage. Following the interval already mentioned, the second phase of the launcher campaign commenced less than three weeks ago. The launcher was rolled out to the forward zone for final preparation, including a rehearsal of third stage fueling. 10 days back and the gantry was broke up and closed over the launcher for final pre-launch operation. We are using an Ariane 42P for this, the third launch of 1999. This will be the 87th flight by an Ariane 4 and the 13th time this version has flown. Total liftoff mass is 323 metric tons and maximum thrust on liftoff will be 4,007 well, kilonewtons. We're going to show you some footage of the Telecom One satellite campaign. This is the third Ariane launch for Indonesia following Palapa C2 in 1996 and Chakravata 1 in 1997. This confirms the very strong Ariane Espace position in the Asia Pacific zone. More on this later. The Toucan normally stages and boosters from Europe to Kourou was available on this occasion to bring the Telecom One spacecraft down from Port Canaveral in Florida, docking in Kourou on 6th July. The spacecraft was uh, then transferred to the S-1B preparation facility for its initial uh, system checkout. Telcom 1 was then moved to the S3B uh, facility only one kilometer from the pad for the hazardous operation phase. These include the spacecraft fueling. We see the fuel men in the escape suites, which uh, incorporates autonomous racing equipment engaged in this task. This was followed by the combined launcher spacecraft operation phase. Telcom 1 was mounted on its payload adapter, the actual interface with the launcher and encapsulated in the fairing. Transfer to the pad took place on Thursday last when Telcom 1 was hoisted to the spacecraft platform and met it with the launcher the following day. 
Telcom One uh, was built by Lockheed Martin Space Systems. Its standard geostationary transfer orbit apogee will be at 35,785 kilometers and final orbit position at 108, 108 degrees east. A quick virtual helicopter flip now on our way to visit the launch control center, the CDL. We're now inside the CDL, and to show us around Jean-Pierre Chapelle. The CDL team is headed by the COEL, freely translated from the French as Launch Site Operations Manager. Philippe Urs, in the red shirt, is in the COEL hot seat for tonight's launch of Flight 118. His team comprises specialists in the various disciplines involved, electronics, telemetry, propellants, safety, and so on. Their task is to supervise and cross-check all final preparation pr procedures on the launcher itself and the other ground components of the complete system, the mobile launch table, umbilical tower, fueling systems, etc. The COIL and CDL team, like all other operational personnel, are designated specifically for each launch campaign. All disciplines and responsibilities are covered several times over. This means it is relatively rare for the same specialist to take on same assignment for two consecutive flights. Some more film now, which provides a broad overview of the organization, industrial partners and production facilities backing INS bus launch activities. This clip is intended principally for those of you joining us for your first Ariane launch broadcast. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll be back after the break. Versatile. Flexible. Powerful. pour le début de la séquence synchronisée, top de moins 7 minutes.
back into real time, all is still green, and that includes weather conditions. The last report was good, and we'll have the final pre-window of pre-launch prospects just 10 minutes before liftoff time T. 17 and a half minutes to go, so we have time for one more excursion outside the commentary cabin. Over to you, Simon. I'm in front of the Jupiter 2 building, which houses the Ariane Launch Mission Control Center. We're at the end of the four-month gap in launch operations, and as this period has been rich in other space-related events, we're going to show you a film summary, starting with the European Space Agency Ministerial Conference in Brussels in May. The European Space Agency Council meeting at ministerial level, which took place in Brussels on May 11th and 12th, produced a number of important decisions for Ariane activities, most notably regarding funding for phases two and three of the Ariane Plus performance enhancement program. This set the scene for Ariane Espace to issue a second Ariane 5 production order for 20 launches. The 1,000th Viking engine used for the Ariane 4 first and second stages and liquid propellant boosters came off the SEP Snecma production line. The occasion for an appropriate ceremony, not to mention celebrations, at the SEP Vernon plant. Pictures now of the Flight 117 liftoff, the second launch of 1999 carrying INSAT 2E, which provided another typical example of Ariane orbit injection accuracy in emulation of Flight 116 five weeks earlier, which launched Arabsat 3A and Skynet 4E. News of all three of these spacecraft is good. The extended pause in launch operations has been used to good purpose. Extensive maintenance work has been carried out on the Ariane 4 launch site to ensure maximum launch capacity and flexibility. The Ariane 5 final preparation building is being altered to cater for the future cryogenic upper stage version, and the ELA-3 flame chutes have been modified to ensure improved payload acoustic conditions. Work has also continued on the new preparation facility for super heavy and other new types of payload. The very perturbed satellite schedules that we observe right now demand from Ariane Space a great level of flexibility in terms of mission analysis, in terms of the use of our satellite preparation facilities here at CSG, and to use very reduced margins between two launch launches. Third stage fueling with the very uh, low temperature liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants, which can only be done immediately before launch because of the temperature problem. And that is almost finished. And for latecomers, we are less than 15 minutes from scheduled liftoff. Production time in mission control, so I must dash back to the commentary cabin to give Mr. Chichiger a hand. I'll be right back. Now some introductions we'd like you to meet. First, the range operations manager, the DDO, for flight 118, Philippe Mauvin. Almost immediately after liftoff, the DDO will begin feeding us with launcher in flight status information. We'll tell you how he gets this information at the appropriate time. And alongside him. And alongside him. Oh, that was quick. Never run so fast. The Ariane Space Mission Director for this launch, Didier Cassé, and now in camera, also meet Jean Rossignol, Ariane Space COO. He heads the Flight Command cell for tonight's launch. An impressive title, Flight Command cell. So what is its actual function, I measured? Well, in fact, the Flight Command cell uh, or normally has a strictly supervisory function and only intervenes in the event of a major problem. For example, where a decision to go ahead with the launch or stop the count has to be taken. This can also involve consulta consultation with the satellite customer. Support is also permanently available from the project room at Ariane Espace headquarters in Evry near Paris in France. And we're going to uh, continue the introductions. Tom Dodd, uh, uh, launch vehicle manager, uh, Lockheed Martin. Alan McLiberty, Satellite Program Manager, Lockheed Martin. And now Trevor Lewis, Consultant. 
And finishing up this row, David Kustiva, Satellite Mission Director for Telcom. And we come to the PT Telcom film. PT Telecomunikasi Indonesia for Telcom is the state-owned telecommunication operator in Indonesia. To support its expansion plans, it went public in 1995 and listed in New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, Jakarta Stock Exchange, and Surabaya Stock Exchange. Telcom bears the responsibilities to serve and provide links uniting Indonesian archipelago. Besides, PT Telcom contains important and strategic position in sustaining Indonesian national development. To improve its services, PT Telcom had launched communication satellites and built transmitters across Indonesia. In parallel with Indonesian economic and social developments, Telkom appends its services to include intelligence network, integrated service digital network, personal exchange, fiber to the crub, telematic terminal, and to expand its fiber optic network based on synchronous digital hierarchy. These facilities and services benefit business, education, and socio-political environment in Indonesia. They link inter-island communication and global network as well. However, PT Telcom has never been satisfied. It continuously and restlessly aims to improve its products and customer services. Its customer service, technical operators, and engineers perform their tasks around the clock diligently and excellently. It also develops and tests information technologies through its research facilities or RISTI and establishes partnerships and joint ventures with several world operators. Telcom also builds cooperative working relationship with well-known universities and institutes to increase and strengthen its human resources knowledge and ability. Moreover, Telcom also provides scholarships to send its employees achieving higher education and qualification program abroad. The management carefully designs and formulates future expansion plans. PT Telcom also establishes and employs a comprehensive training center to enhance its employees' knowledge and expertise. These efforts is to achieve its primary goals. Becoming the Indonesian best and world-class operator. So, you've been listening to the final weather report message. What uh, do we have? We have good news. Uh, all is well with no risk of adverse conditions inside the safety radius and throughout the launch window. Remember, Simon, we have a near, nearly two-hour margin. And who have we got here? Ah, um, Dodit Hendroyono, Telcom One coordinator. Bort Eilertsen, Arena Spas payload manager. And Arafin Nurkrovo, Telecom One Program Manager. And in a moment, we're going to show you a few moments in the customer team's time at work and play during the satellite campaign. Start 
Apart from uh, those here in the Mission Control Satellite, personnel are all variously in the CDL and the S1 building. Nail biting time for them also. Yes, they can only wait like everyone else until their next tasks begin after Telcom 1 separation. And our last piece of film, Ariane 5 Logistics. From the Seine to Kourou, from the ice and snow of Europe to the equatorial heat of French Guiana. Logistics, so frequently understated, are very much at the heart of the success of Ariane. This is why dedicated resources have been developed for such tasks as launcher transport. This includes the recently commissioned Ariane 5 carrier ship, the MN Toucan. The Toucan is a veritable ocean-going launcher ferry of impressive dimensions. 96 meters long, with a beam of 17 meters, and a height of 8 meters above the waterline, and with a large afterdeck. Following pickups in Bremen and Rotterdam, the Toucan leaves the port of Le Havre by night on course for French Guiana. Arrival in the Kourou Channel is by day. C'est un bateau très difficile pour le chenalage, mais il manœuvre très bien. C'est un bateau très difficile. And a few words from the port of Kourou pilot. The Toucan is a difficult ship to navigate in a narrow channel. However, it handles very well. It has the right equipment and a good crew who know their job. That's what makes the task much easier. We're a little more than six and a half minutes from the end of a count, which has been running now for over 14 hours. And the third stage tanks will be topped off and fully pressurized in about one minute from now. We're approaching a fundamental change in the launcher control situation. This will occur six minutes before time T, first stage ignition, when we enter the synchronized sequence. Explanations when we get there. And for the moment, our status panel is still like the Emerald Isle. À tous de DDO, attention pour le début de la séquence synchronisée. Top H0 moins six minutes. And we're now inside the six-minute synchronized sequence, and control of the launcher has switched from the human operators to the two ground computers in the launch control center. The reason for this is no mystery. During the final phase of the count, the mass of data to be collected, sorted, and processed, and above all checked, is so vast that the quantity of command signals to be generated and transmitted is so great that the, the, the task could not be handled in so short a time, even with hundreds of additional personnel. So what, in fact, actually happens, Masut? It confirms. And we have, in fact, the latest weather picture of this zone. What does it tell us, uh, Masut? Well, uh, Simon, uh, everything is fine. It confirms the clearance. We had a few minutes back. No immediate threat of electrical storms in our backyard. That's good. And we have third stage topping off completed. Coming back to your earlier question, uh, as you said, the control switches to the two ground computers and all resources used in the launch systems are synchronized on a common final countdown sequence, hence the name. One computer configures the flute and propellant systems for flight and executes the uh, associated checkout routines. The other carries out similar tasks for preparation of the electrical systems. Uh, this includes initiation of the flight program, start up of the two servo motors, uh, switch over from ground to onboard power and so on. The computers also cross-check each other. And the launch time has now been loaded in the onboard computer. If we have a red state come up for any reason inside the synchronized sequence, the count returns to minus six minutes, the launcher is returned to the safety state and we go on hold. I hope we won't need to explain what happens then. And better later than never, we would like to say a more personal hello to our viewers on the observation sites here in French Guiana, including Mission Control itself, of course. Seven sites in France, viewers taking the Space Night TV program in Germany, viewers in Washington, D.C. in the U.S., and Tokyo, Japan, and with a special word of greeting once again to those of you in Jakarta. Now satellites switch to onboard power. And we keep peeping into the CDL with the computers in charge. They may want to relax, but that's just not possible at the present time. 
they do have an override function after all, do they not, Mesut? Uh, indeed, yes, Simon. Uh, manual override is possible at any time during the synchronized sequence up to uh, five seconds before the ignition of the main engines. And uh, would the project team in every be in, involved in such a situation? Well, uh, this could happen. The project room is a, a kind of a miniature uh, CDL staffed by experts who monitor everything that is going on in the CDL and on the launch site and who can provide expert advice in case of need remotely. Well, the satellite's been uh, sitting up on top of the launcher for quite a while now, obviously in a controlled environment in the same way as from start of manufacture even. So how is this achieved on the launch pad, Mesut? Uh, temperature, humidity and pressure conditions are controlled via the umbilical tower from the moment the payload is hoisted to the top of the launcher, continuing after gantry removal and only terminating when the umbilical plugs are disconnected as liftoff occurs. Well, in a moment now, here we are. We have a close-up of the cryogenic fueling arms, which are still coupled to the third stage valve plates. With the fueling task completed, the arms continue to provide a stabilizing function after gantry withdrawal. Two cameras are used to produce this squashed launcher effect. You see it now. And we shall see this shot again when the arms open just five seconds before first stage ignition. The tracking stations, the downrange tracking stations, must be on full alert now, Mesut. Yes, Simon. Uh, of course, uh, the Kourou and Cayenne radar stations locked onto the launcher on the pad a while back and have been steadily tracking a stationary object ever since. And in just two seconds, we have the third stage motors armed. Tension is uh, just about peaking here in mission control in the CDL and the S1 building as we wait for the first of the three key events of the, of the uh, flight, namely liftoff. And uh, a final call to order for very late latecomers. Drinks down, gentlemen, please. Face the screen uh, for Ariane Espace Flight 118 with Telecom 1. À tous de DDO. Attention pour moins d'une minute. Top H0 moins une minute. We're inside the final minute. The launcher is on on board power. And time to wish the Telecom One teams, wherever they are, good luck, fellas. Fly safely. The servo motors are armed. And we shall have release of the inertial guidance platform at minus nine seconds. The cryogenic arms will open at minus five seconds. First stage ignition at time T. And the launch table clamps will open at plus 4.2 seconds for Ariane liftoff. Now it's up to the DDO, the ground computers, and the flight program in that order. À tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top, allumage. We have ignition. We have liftoff. Décollage. Paramètres bord normaux. Le pilotage est normal. We'll leave the picture to speak for itself for a little while. Long. Tous les paramètres bord sont normaux. Extinction des papes. We have a steady burn and now we have burnout of the solid propellant boosters. Tous les paramètres bord sont normaux. And the announcements are flooding through from the DDO, announcing that all onboard data is nominal. We've had the uh, tilt maneuver, and we notice the widening climb angle as, as altitude increases. And you may just catch the rumble of Ariane. We can hear it clearly as the launcher passes almost exactly above the Jupiter building.
We're now a minute and a half into mission. Altitude 12 and a half kilometers. Separation des propulseurs d'appoint à poudre. And we have the announcement of the booster separation. We're tracking at Les the moment. Les paramètres bord sont normaux. We're tracking at the moment from the radar stations at Kourou and Cayenne. And as we hand over to the downrange stations, we shall tell you the details as they occur. Two minutes into mission, Ariane is already supersonic. And we have the trajectory plot on our screen now for a while, so I think it, this is the time to give some explanation, Masut. Yes, um, now we are 139 seconds into the flight, and altitude is uh, reached to almost 30 kilometers, and we are cruising with almost like a kilometer per second uh, speed, as we see at the bottom of the uh, screen with V parameter. And uh, on the trajectory curve, you will notice there is uh, a little cross inside a little circle. The circle represents theoretical position of the launcher on its tra trajectory, and the cross is actual, so it is looking very accurate at the moment. We are now three minutes into mission. And uh, over 50 kilometers on altitude, and uh, speed is a little more than one and a half kilometer per second. And we continue to hear from the DDO that onboard data is nominal. And uh, there are two processes which are carrying, out, c carrying on as we climb up. One of them is the venting of the fairing. A word on that, Mesut? Well, that is the adjustment of the, uh, the payload compo compartment uh, pressure-wise uh, until the fairing jettisoning that's going to happen. And the other, of course, is chill down of the uh, fuel circuits of the third stage, the valves and the pipes. Yeah, that is to do because uh, we have the, uh, the uh, uh, liquid uh, uh, oxygen and hydrogen is very, very low temperature. But that's going to start almost like a, a one minute, one and a half minute before the uh, third stage uh, ignition. Les paramètres bord sont normaux. And we're approaching uh, separation of the fairing, which will uh, now be no longer needed as we get into the thinner upper layers of the atmosphere. Of course, the idea is to get rid of the uh, parts not needed anymore. Coiffe. Indeed, this is part of the regular, and then we have a, a computer assisted. Uh, The mass loss process is uh, continuous, continuous and uh, absolutely essential. Any spurious mass is shed at the very first uh, possible moment. Les paramètres bord sont stables. We have to use the propellants very intelligently. Indeed. And we are now five minutes into mission with about 30 seconds to go to stage three shutdown. Altitude nearly 150 kilometers. Now we've hit it, and our speed is up to over four kilometers per second. Les paramètres bord sont normaux et stables. And my little conversion chart tells me that that is the equivalent of 14,500 odd kilometers per hour. Extinction deuxième étage. Burnout of stage two. Separation deuxième étage. Separation in stages two and three. Allumage, troisième étage. And the second key event in the flight, ignition of stage three. A word perhaps about uh, separation procedures, uh, Masoud. How do we get the two stages apart? Well, through the, uh, the uh, uh, pyrotechnic separation cord, uh, which uh, detaches the, uh, the stages from each other. Bord normal. And also uh, acceleration and deacceleration rockets used to push uh, of the stages from each other. Right. And we're um, coming Pilotage up normal. to the next downrange station acquisition, which will be Natal, 
in just a few seconds' time. We have a four-minute overlap between coverage, radar coverage, between Kurukai and, and then Natal. Anyway, it's, uh, we've now settled into... And there we have the announcement of acquisition by Natal in Brazil. Les we've, paramètres bord sont normaux. we've settled into the long burn time for the third stage, which is over 12 minutes, and it's really time we talk to some more about our passenger Telcom 1 and uh, a little bit, perhaps, about uh, the customer, PT Telecomunicasi Indonesia. Yes, we can say a few words about Telcom One. Telcom One is uh, primarily designed for direct TV broadcasting, telephony and multimedia services, manufactured by Lockheed Martin. Uh, it is the third Indonesian spacecraft to be launched by Arinas Bus. Telcom One will uh, ensure SATCOM uh, service continuity for Indonesia's uh, leading operator. PT Telecomunicasi Indonesia. I hope I said it right. Mm -hmm. Indonesia is uh, one of the first countries uh, that set up a satellite system in the Asia Pacific zone. Uh, Telecom One spacecraft has uh, 36 uh, transponders, 24 of them are C band transponders, and the other 12 are extended C band transponders, and has a uh, predicted uh, orbit life of 15 years uh, 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 concerning the uh, uh, station keeping uh, fuel needed for the spacecraft. Right, and um, looking at your trajectory chart, you'll see that we're coming up to a peak, and then there'll be, this will be followed by a dip, and the trajectory, as announced by the DDO, is absolutely spot on. Yes. The trajectory dips in uh, a few moments' time. Uh, explanation? Well, uh, that is, again, uh, that is the calculated trajectory, which is uh, to use the uh, onboard fuel intel intelligently. We're losing the altitude, but we're gaining speed. And then we're going to pick up the altitude again after this dip. Uh, it's basically a, a uh, slingshot. Exactly. Uh, this is, uh, well, uh, using the uh, onboard propellant intelligently uh, to arrive the injected injection orbit. Right. And uh, we are now about nine and a half minutes burn time to go with stage three. Well, let's talk a bit uh, about our postponement because uh, it was not all bad. As we heard at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, our eight-day postponement was made necessary by the replacement of a third-stage latch valve relay box. What did this involve for the launcher, that is, uh, message? Well, uh, this is our uh, quality assurance program, as you can see, that uh, following an uh, electrical system anomaly observed during one of the similar third-stage engines uh, acceptance test in Vernon facility in uh, France, uh, one of the uh, four electro valve interface units of that particular engine showed a presence of a metallic particle, particle causing a short. And then the decision has been made to uh, subject all these electro valve interface units to a visual inspection, followed by a quick acceptance test program to prove their flight integrity and change the existing ones uh, already integrated on the third stage engines. This process uh, resulted with eight days uh, delay for the Telcom 1 launch, Les paramètres bord sont normaux. which was originally scheduled for 4th of August, as uh, we all know. A new launch date of August 12th allowed us the component changeout procedure to be implemented and the time required for final verifications and resumption of the launch countdown for a, a good, uh, a safe uh, launch. And you'll notice uh, that uh, the altitude is uh, about to uh, decline very slightly, and uh, but we're gonna more substantially later on. We're going to see uh, that speed is uh, going to increase as the altitude is, is getting less. Indeed. Anyway, uh, coming back to our subject, inside the gantry, the payload platform is a sealed clean room, air-conditioned area, of course. But what special actions had to be taken in regard to the satellite during the extra waiting time on top of the launcher? And before you answer, we have just uh, lost signal by Kuru, but of course we still have um, overlap with Natal before we pick up the launcher by Ascension, Ascension Island. 
Well, um, uh, first of all, uh, Talcom 1 spacecraft has never been exposed to the entry. It was in its uh, fairing and payload compartment. Uh, the Flight 118 launcher remained inside this 98-meter tall and, like you said, climate-controlled gantry at the LA-2 launch zone. The Telcom 1 spacecraft was always protected inside the payload fairing and continuously monitored by the uh, Lockheed Martin launch team. Uh, I believe they uh, continued trickle charging of the batteries and maintained the spacecraft in very safe uh, and good condition. Fine. Well, with the machine now running again, namely the Ariane launch system, it'll be a question of packing them in uh, for many months to come. We have uh, two Ariane 4 launches, launches scheduled for September. So what about after that uh, message? Well, uh, four more to go to the end of the year, uh, the last one being the Ariane 504 launch for XMM spacecraft. And uh, we believe uh, we're going to achieve this uh, in minimum of six launches uh, after tonight's one, which we have uh, shown this uh, during the second Les halves of 97 stable. and 98. We had a similar uh, picture because of the spacecraft uh, uh, readiness uh, problems. Okay, well, uh, one benefit of the launch layoff has been that we've been able to get ahead with the, of the game with the ground facility maintenance, and we have six minutes of uh, propulsion time left, burn time left on stage three. And uh, this has uh, very fortunately been the case as we have this uh, tightly packed uh, manifest for the next 12 months at least. Work has also been proceeding, I understand, with the new EPCU 2000 payload complex. And uh, I noticed that uh, this is some distance from the S1 and S3 buildings. Why is this, uh, Masut? Well, uh, the idea is putting the, uh, the, this new facility for the S1 and S3 activities in the same uh, uh, zone. It's going to uh, give us additional payload processing capacity. As we all uh, know that uh, the uh, sometimes spacecraft readiness schedules causing uh, a lot of concern for the manifest and uh, actually launch manifest becomes uh, a very dynamic uh, launch planning. Uh, having these extra facilities, it's going to give us chance and flexibility to process more spacecraft parallel and to recover from this uh, Surprises, latent surprises. Okay, well, the, the, the words uh, more spacecraft makes me think of new contracts. Yes. What's the situation with uh, new business this year, Mesut? The, well, the market uh, in general is uh, fairly depressed for a number of reasons, but um, how has any of this been doing during the year so far? Well, uh, so far so good. Uh, we have signed a total of six uh, launch contracts uh, since the beginning of uh, this year, uh, 99. Some number of contracts are still in negotiations. They're in process. Uh, we expect this uh, signed contract number to be doubled by end of this year in minimum. And in fact, we have gone over the 200 mark. Yes, and our backlog uh, after normal, il reste uh, minutes de this Telcom 1 launch will be 41 spacecraft uh, remain to be launched. And we have uh, less than four minutes burn time with stage three. Well, a word now, I think, uh, about uh, Ariane 5, because this is a very fin much ongoing situation. La station de Natal. And we have uh, loss of signal by Natal. Uh, the launcher for Flight uh, 504 has been, uh, the Ariane 5 launcher for 504 has been in Kourou for a considerable time already. It's ready to go, but it's been stuck for passengers. But we now have a relatively firm launch date and a definite passenger. That's, uh, yes, uh, we're going to launch XMM uh, 504. Uh, but then uh, we have uh, six, uh, oh, I mean, approximately six uh, Ariane 5 launches that we schedule, we forecast for year 2000. We want to start the, the millennium, uh, the next century, with uh, some number of Ariane 5 launches. And, of course, uh, Ariane 4 will um, carry on for quite a while yet alongside Ariane 5. Added flexibility for Ariane Espace. Of course, of course. And uh, like uh, during your film also uh, that you mentioned that uh, cryogenic uh, upper stage uh, modifications that we were 
la trajectoire est normale, les paramètres sont normaux. Build facility. Yes. Well, with that, hopefully by end of 2001 or uh, early 2002, we are expecting Ariane 5 payload uh, lift of capacity to be increased uh, almost 2.6 tons with the cryogenic second stage. And we have two minutes of burn time left with stage three. Uh, altitude is down. All right. But it's going up again, down below the 200 mark, and our uh, velocity is nearly eight and a half kilometers per second, uh, with a target figure of 9.7 for orbit injection. 9.7 kilometers per second is 35,000 kilometers per hour, faster than you and I can run <laughs> machines. <laughs> of course, and many of us. We've talked about uh, Aryan flexibility and adaptability in regard to uh, volatile payload availability. But another big plus for Ariane, of course, is orbit injection precision. Yes, uh, orbit injection precision is uh, one of our normal, uh, features, normal. which with uh, good performance, uh, good injection orbit is, uh, you know, that means a more propellant life and a better orbit raising uh, uh, chances for uh, the passenger. Surely. And, and it is achieved by the, uh, Il reste une minute de the good, accurate uh, electronic systems of the attitude control subsystem. Indeed. And we have less than a minute to go for before shutdown of stage three. We have, in fact, about uh, 35 seconds now. And I think we'll wait for the event. And I believe with this uh, performance of tonight, we're going to maintain uh, the forecasted uh, flight reserve in the third stage uh, uh, fuel tanks. Indeed. Uh, you will notice a difference in terminology La when we normal. come to the moment, because we are going to shut down the stage three engine. Powered flight is almost end. Extinction, troisième étage. Shutdown of stage three. Shutdown. Acquisition de la station télémesure de Libreville. And we have the launcher picked up by the telemetry tracking station in Libreville, with about one minute overlap with Ascension Island. Now we have the SCAR procedure yes. in process between now and separation of Telcom One in a couple of minutes' time. Yes, this uh, SCAR phase is a very important phase now. Uh, of course, uh, third stage powered flight phase is very important. Now, uh, a uh, launcher, uh, electronic brain of the launcher now controls the orientation and separation sequences for the uh, Telcom 1 satellite. Uh, it uh, prepares the uh, separation uh, second uh, for the uh, Telcom 1 spacecraft. And we uh, achieve this uh, using the, uh, the, the, the gaseous hydrogen through this uh, attitude control uh, subsystem thrusters of the third stage. We should have separation in just under a minute. Uh, by the way, uh, our interpretation for this phase is, in, is a space ballet. It's a space ballet. Um, indeed, a very apt description. And we have lost signal by ascension. We are tracking. Uh, uh, by Libreville alone now. And we have half a minute to go before the third key event of this flight. And our velocity is almost up to the 9.7 Mark, I told you about. Now launcher ensures all the separation conditions now.
séparation Telcom. And we have the announcement of separation of our payload, our passenger tonight, Telcom One. I think we could explain uh, message very quickly why the announcement came something like 30, 35 seconds after the actual event in real time. Well, um, the deal flight uh, director gets this information from Montan de Pair telemetry uh, center that we uh, gather all the spacecraft real time telemetry uh, from the downrange stations. Sometimes uh, the arrival of this telemetry and the process of it, uh, it takes some time. That's the little uh, time difference that uh, resulted. Uh, the, the man in charge, the responsible person from the Montan de Pair, gives this information directly to DDO, and then DDO announces in Jupiter, as we see also from the screens. Right, and uh, just a quick word about the future of uh, Telecom One. The uh, first acquisition by the Guam satellite tracking station uh, should occur 52 minutes after liftoff. The first uh, Apogee engine burn 26 and a half hours after liftoff. The solar panels should be deployed in about five days from now. Testing, testing should be completed by early October by which time the satellite should be operational. And we're going to have our first replay. Allumage. Décollage. Paramètres bord normaux. Le pilotage est normal. Tous les paramètres bord sont normaux. Extinction des papes. Well, that looked almost as good as the first time round. <laughs> <laughs> one thing we should, uh, one, one, one quick word about um, avoidance and preservation, I think, uh, just to reassure people, Masut. Well, uh, after the uh, separation of Telcom 1 spacecraft, the launcher, or what is the remaining part of the uh, launcher, uh, has to uh, go away, and we have to separate the bodies as much as possible uh, to prevent any uh, physical contact of these two bodies and uh, uh, with some orientation maneuvers uh, the launcher s starts uh, getting away from the uh, separated spacecraft and that's the avoidance maneuver and we're going to have another replay before the uh, speeches top allumage Décollage. Paramètres bord normaux. And uh, before the speeches commence, I have an important uh, announcement to make. As most of you know, yesterday's attempted total eclipse was not entirely successful. <laughs> so we're going for a fresh try tomorrow at the same time. We're into the count, and it looks good for eclipse in just over 10 hours from now. <laughs> Well, this is when the relaxation is really showing itself. The tension has been particularly long on this occasion with the eight-day postponement, a strain for everybody, and the nerves which came close to snapping uh, only 25 minutes back are now unburdened. Well, as always, the success of this flight paves the way for the next Ariane Espace launch, which we'll hear about in a moment, no doubt.
from Jacques Rossignol, CEO of Alien Espace. Well, uh, a few, few words as, as it needs uh, to, to be. Uh, first, this launch was followed by our friend in, in uh, Jakarta. Uh, I guess there was many people over there, uh, but I have to name Mr. Giri Suseno, Minister of Transport and Telecom, who was here last week, but unfortunately could not attend his launch. Mr. Tanera Beng, Minister of State Companies, and Mr. Nasushion, President and Director of Telcom. So uh, I'd like to address my congratulations for this success to them. Indonesia was the third country to use telecommunication by satellite after the US and uh, Canada. So it was a great pleasure for us when Indonesia selected Ariane Espace to, to launch Telcom One. As a matter of fact, it's the third time we have been selected by Indonesia, and we are extremely pleased to offer Indonesia this, uh, this success. The satellite project is a long process. It's an expensive process. It's uh, extend over two and a half years or something like that. But uh, we have to recognize that probably the launch phase is the most critical. So uh, it's a great relief for us, obviously, and uh, for your project to uh, be uh, successfully launched tonight. Uh, it is, as all of you know here, the 45th success in a row for Ariane Espace. We have launched successfully for more than four and a half years out of Kourou. So uh, we have to congratulate our team from Ariane Espace, from CNES, from our industrial partner, for their dedication to the safety of the launch. Uh, our customer recognize that because I am glad to announce today that we have signed last week three more contracts. So after this launch tonight, we have a launch backlog of 43 launches. And the next launch will occur September 1st as uh, we have been late for a week on this launch, we are uh, trying to recover to match our objective to uh, launch uh, eight times from now and seven times now from, uh, from today to the end of the year. So it's, it's a great challenge, but as I said, the, the team are ready and really uh, extremely, extremely strong and motivated to, to achieve it. So Mr. Dadat Pustiva. <clears throat> Praise be all to God, the Almighty, that has granted us all the good things during this campaign a few minutes ago. And this is an indication of a very strong commitment of PT Telecommunikasi Indonesia to serve our customer and the people of Indonesia by providing satellite transmission facilities with the latest technology for at least 20 years from now. And of course, at the end of this campaign, I would like to submit my gratitude to Ariane Space, to Lockheed Martin, Telesat, and also to telecom people for their best performance, their strong support, and serious support, and most of all, for their best trust and teamwork. Merci Buko, thank you very much. Décollage. Paramètres bord normaux.
le pilotage est normal. Well, it still looks paramètres. as good as ever, as good as ever. And uh, that is probably the last of the replays. And before we round it all off, uh, my co-commentator, Mr. Chichika, would like to say a few words. Thanks, Simon, for this opportunity. Uh, this uh, is uh, one of the uh, last missions that I uh, did it for uh, Arianes Pass uh, to Kourou. Uh, next week, uh, that'll be my last week uh, working for Arianes Pass, and then I will be going to the other side of the ocean to continue my professional life. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all my colleagues at uh, Arianes Pass, at CSG, at CNES, uh, for their uh, support, continued support that they've shown towards me, and all my customers all our customers uh, for their uh, beautiful and very meaningful cooperation that they have shown towards me. And I wish uh, all the best for INSPAS.